So my name is Victor Vogel. Um, I describe myself as a recovering academic. Um, for 35 years, I was a medical school professor. Um, and now I'm what I call a real doctor. Real doctors see patients every day. Um, and I have done, for 35 years, only breast cancer. So I've done clinical research in breast cancer, and I take care of women with breast cancer. But I've been doing this for 44 years, and I'm going to retire in September. So three years ago, I said, why don't I do something with this 40-year flying career that I can do in retirement? So I became a CFI and IGI, AGI, a lot. Um, and I'm going to teach flying. Um, so I bring that perspective of a physician uh, and a CFI. I'll tell you a funny story. When, when I was in my, very early in my career, I was in Boston having breakfast one morning for a meeting in, um, in the restaurant. They were in the checkout line at the, at the cash register. And there was a Delta pilot there. And I, I asked him, I said, uh, you mind if I ask you a question? He said, oh, sure. And this was when, this was even before I had an instrument. I had a post private pilot. So I said to him, I said, well, you know, I'm a physician, but I've really kind of always wanted to be an airline pilot. And I said to him, have you ever wanted to be a physician? <laughs> he just looked at me and laughed and said, no, I really like what I do. Um, so um, we have um, a flight school in central Pennsylvania, um, right along the Susquehanna River. Where is that? In Seals Road, just north of Harrisburg. I'm from Lewisburg, so. I live in Lewisburg. Oh, you do? <laughs> Why don't I know you? I grew up there. Did you really? Because I lived there at age 12. <laughs> well, I've, I've lived there for the last 12 years. We love it. None of you know Lewisburg. It's the home of Bucknell University. It's a lovely town. And the home of Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary. Yes. <laughs> Where so the Watergate conspirators were. Our, our daughter got married a few years ago, and I was talking to our son-in-law's family. Talked to one guy and said that he was a, a federal prosecutor. Okay. And he asked me where we lived. And I said, well, we live in Lewisburg. He says, oh, I know Lewisburg. I said, a lot of people there. <laughs> 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 All right. So we, we have a Redbird FMX in our flight school um, that we've had for about 15 months. And um, I train instrument students in it. And, uh, we do all kinds of fun things with our, with our other uh, pilots. We have a, a pilot organization that meets, uh, in fact, they're meeting this evening, maybe the second Wednesday of every month. And uh, last month, we had a little fun in the simulator, getting the various scenarios um, that wouldn't be safe to do in the airplane. So it's those kinds of things that I want to talk to you about. How many here are um, CFIs? Is everybody a CFI? 90%. Okay. Um, and the first part of this, I'm going to put on my doctor hat, and we're going to talk about the physiology, or the pathophysiology, if you will, of spatial disorientation. Now, I will do for you what I do with my patients. I will not speak doctor talk. This will be so simple that even CFI is going to be <laughs> I should say. I had a software developer say to me one time, he says, Doc, this is going to be so simple, even doctors can do it. Um, so first we're going to say what spatial disorientation is. We're going to talk about the physiology, and as I said, the physiology, how that occurs, and how a flight simulator can help pilots understand this, and what factors make it more likely to occur. Um, and we'll learn how understanding spatial disorientation I really believe could prevent loss of control. And we all know what those most common causes are, but I'll review those with you and give my opinion about how simulator training could reduce those. So what's spatial disorientation? So this, this is a picture I took at the New York Air Show three Aprils ago. And if you look at that carefully, you'll notice that the F-15 on the left is flying wheels up. Um, so they flew by show center, one upright, one upside down. So, what is it and why is it important? Well, the official definition is it refers to the lack of orientation with regard to position, attitude, or movement of the airplane in space. Sounds pretty straightforward, 
Um, but when you're not oriented to position, attitude, or movement, some bad things can happen. And the statistics are not very encouraging. Um, and you can see that it says that between 5 and 10 percent of all general aviation accidents are the result of spatial disorientation, and that's bad enough. But the next line is really where the, it gets serious is that 90% of those accidents are fatal. And then you say to yourself, well, how, how would that work out? Um, is, it, is it just VFR pilots flying into IMC? No, when you look at the data, and this, if you can't read this, the, the dark blue is day non-rated, that is non-instrument rated. Um, and then this light blue is day instrument rated. Red is night non-rated, non-IFR rated. And gray is night instrument rated. Well, look at this. Here's IFR into IMC or in IMC. And look at the night accident rate among IFR pilots. So there's not a lot of logic to this. So the message here is spatial disorientation can happen to any pilot with any rating, any time, day or night, in any weather. That was a surprise when I started to bore into um, spatial disorientation. So how in the world does this happen? What is it that causes spatial disorientation? Well, if you think about this, you know, the older I get, my internist, you know, we doctors have doctors, right? And I go to my doctor, and he says, well, I got, a, I got something you ought to practice. And this was about 10 years ago. And he said, stand on one leg. I can do that for a little while. He says, now stand on one leg with your eyes closed. And as you get older, you'll find out that that becomes more and more difficult to do. Why? Because our ability to stand upright and to know in the lay terms, which end is up, depends on three systems. We have this vestibular system, which is in our inner ear. And I'll unpack that for you in a moment. And then we have this somatosensory system. Um, we have small sensory nerves all throughout our muscles and our nervous system that sense muscle tension and movement and position. And then, obviously, the best way to tell which way is up is keep your eyes open. Um, but there are many situations, as I'm sure you're aware, in an airplane, either with darkness or IMC or some obstruction to visibility um, that may not make our visual system totally reliable. The vestibular system senses this position in a way that depends on the physiology of the inner ear. The somatosensory system is this, it's what we commonly refer to as the seat of the pants feeling. It's what we feel in our skin, our muscles, our joints, along with our hearing that tell us where we are relative to gravity, how do the muscles feel, and what, what sounds am I hearing that help contribute to my spatial orientation. And the first two, along with your eyesight, are how you keep up with it. Now, here's the only medical school slide. We'll unpack this, all right? So here's your eardrum, and here's your inner ear. And you have, in your inner ear, three orthogonally related semicircular canals. They're all three at mutually right angles. And those roughly correspond to what we all know is y'all picture roll. Um, and movement, but not just constant rate movement, it's acceleration is what's sensed by this inner ear semicircular canal. This part of the semicircular canal is called the otolith organ. And it has in the in the middle this thing called the cupola. And this cupola, these hair cells, these microscopically fine hair cells, are attached to the vestibular nerve. That's your eighth cranial nerve, attached right to your brainstem. And 
in accelerated move, motion, not constant rate motion, but accelerated motion, the fluid in the semicircular canal starts to move. The acceleration causes it to move. And it will move in response to accelerated motion. Now, the accelerated motion affects all of the canals, but the one that's most affected is the one that's in the plane of the motion. And the movement of the fluid in the canal causes the hair cells in the cupola to move. It deflects them. And that deflection is then sensed by the vestibular nerve. So that's how the semicircular canals give this orientation information um, to the brainstem, and then the brainstem sends it up to the cortex, and we decide where the movement is and which way we're going. Now, if you took high school or college chemistry, you probably know what an Erlmeyer flask is. It's a conical shaped flask, so that when it's boiling and you're mixing things up in there, it doesn't boil over. And if you've ever swirled an Erlmeyer flask, you can get the fluid in the flask going in the direction of the, the rotation. And then if you stop the swirling motion, the fluid inside continues for a while until it loses momentum and finally stops. Well, that is exactly what happens in the semicircular canal. So here's, here's a semicircular canal. There's our cuba. Here's the endolymph. Here's the hair cells. With no, no angular acceleration, there's no relative motion between the canal and the endolymph. So the hair cells are not deflected, and there's no perception of angular movement. So think of taxi or flying straight and level at a constant airspeed. No acceleration, no movement in the endolymph. It's very hard to sense movement um, when there's no acceleration. Your eyes will tell you that you're moving, but not your semicircular canals. Now, here's acceleration. So we have acceleration going in this direction, and the endolymph flows in the opposite direction. Action, reaction. Angular clockwise acceleration, the inertia causes the endolymph to lag behind. And the cupola is deflected to the right and perceived as clockwise move. So the acceleration is clockwise, the endolymph goes counterclockwise, it pushes the hair cells in the direction of the acceleration, and this acceleration is then perceived as clockwise. All is good. But then you stop accelerating and the angular motion is constant. So the endolymph then moves at the same speed as the canal. There's no relative motion between the canal and the endolymph. The cupola is not deflected, and there's no perceived movement. But you're still moving without acceleration. And then deceleration, or stopping. So now that bank turn, that climb, the descent, descending turn, it stops and the canal stops, but the endolymph momentum keeps it moving, that Erlmeyer flask. You stop the flask, the fluid keeps moving. And it moves clockwise. And then the perception is, remember up here, the endolymph was moving counterclockwise, deflecting the hair cells to the right. Now you stop, now the endolymph, because of that conservation of that angular momentum comes around and moves the hair cells in the other direction and it's perceived as counterclockwise movement. When I was in college, when there were books and libraries back a long time ago, before you, I actually went um, to California with a fraternity brother of mine, a woman I was dating, and went to Disneyland. Wow, that's really cool. I'm going to Disneyland. This is in the early 70s. And, you know, if you've been to Disneyland, this was like the year that Disney World opened, so there wasn't Disney World. Can you imagine that? I lived at a time before Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we go to Disneyland, and it was great. You know, 
heard about it as a kid, and here I was on my college junior. Oh, this is really cool. And they said, let's go on the teacups. Okay. So, you know, if you've never been to Disneyland, they have teacups at Disney World, they probably good. So the, the cup itself, you sit in it, and the cup spins, and then on a larger circular platform, there are four of those cups, and each of the cups is spinning, and the sadists in the cup pull this wheel, <laughs> cups spin faster, and then the whole platform rotates. I was dizzy for hours after that. My indolence must have been doing, you know. So think of that, think of the teacups. Um, so how then, knowing now how the in the circular canals where how our visual system has input and how our somatosensory system work, how then does spatial disorientation occur? Well, under normal conditions, you can see. You can see the horizon, you can tell which way is up, you can tell whether you're banking, climbing, descending, all is well. The sensory system in the inner ear helps confirm what your eyes see. Now, if you close your eyes, then all you got is your vestibular system and the somatosensory system. But if your eyes are open, then what your inner ear is doing what your semicircular canal is doing is confirming what your eyes are seeing. Um, and it helps identify which way we're going. But once you lose visual contact, we all as sensory pilots know about this, then the vestibular system and the somatosensory system, that seat in the pants feeling becomes totally unreliable because of those reversals of acceleration and because you know, they, they say that if an untrained VFR only pilot enters IMC conditions, you've heard about the 178 seconds, right? It's about 178 seconds for the average human being to lose all sense of which way is up if all you have is your inner ears and your seat of the pants feeling you've got no outside visual reference. So most of us, all of us, eventually, would lose control if we had no instruments or no visual orientation. And without those outside references, these combinations of normal motions and these forces that we've been talking about um, create illusions that are very difficult to overcome. And pay attention next time you go flying, and, and you know, most of us have long since learned to ignore those somatosensory sensations. But next time you fly, pay attention to what you feel as you're doing a climb or a descent or a steep turn. And you know, kind of what your, what your um, somatosensory system is telling you. And then, we'll get to this in a moment, do that with your eyes closed. And you'll get some very confusing information. As, have you ever had, uh, the FAA used to do a demonstration with a device called a barony chair. Barony chair, yes. And by there's something also called a vertigon. Um, and those, sometimes they travel around. I think in the past they've been here to Sun and Fun. They've been to um, their venture. Uh, yeah, and you can go in. And the, the barony chair is essentially a chair where, you know, you can spin somebody. Um, and they have, a, they have a stick. And they have a stick, and you ask the subject to maintain control. And, you, very, and you, you, you cover your eyes. Um, yeah. So they, they put a blindfold on and then they spin you around. Oh, Those damn teacups. You wouldn't get me on there, Andrew. I'll we'll probably stop that because of the uh, the resulting cleanup of the floor. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, it induces nausea very quickly. Yeah. Um, and remember this, you get nauseated in two places, in your stomach, but you also get nauseated in your brain. Your, your um, brain stem as a place that we medical oncologists know all about. It's called the chemoreceptor trigger zone. And it's the thing that sees or feels motions and um, noxious substances. And your brain says, I don't like that. Get rid of it. <laughs> and then you get nodded. So know this also. This is important. Illness, many medications, alcohol, fatigue. That's a big one. 
sleep loss and mild hypoxia, all of those make the susceptibility to spatial disorientation much worse. So remember that. Um, and one of the things that I'm starting to write about as a physician CFI is those aeromedical factors that affect all of us when we fly and this notion that each of us before we fly needs to self-certify, we become our own flight surgeon, our own AME before every flight. And we need to run that out safe checklist and all those other things to identify these things and not fly when they occur for a number of reasons, but for the purpose of this talk, to avoid or reduce the likelihood of spatial disorientation. Now, this is a list that all of CFIs know, 10 leading causes of fatal general aviation accidents over the last 15 years or so, 16 years for which there are, are data. Number one, loss of control in flight. Unusual attitudes, turbulence, icy. Um, controlled flight in the terrain. Now we don't know for sure how much of that is due to spatial disorientation, but I would submit to you that I believe at least a significant part of it is probably due to spatial disorientation, or at the very least, spatial D contributes to C fit. Um, not so much for cystic component failures, fuel related, but the unknown or undetermined could certainly include things like visual illusions, night, haze, snow, all of those conditions that can contribute to spatial disorientation. Um, and I would also suggest that in a system failure, like a power plant failure, or certainly a vacuum failure where you lose instruments, but where the attention of the pilot is diverted to deal with that component failure, that can certainly contribute to spatial disorientation, without a doubt, unintended flight into IMC. But remember, unintended flight into IMC is just as bad for an instrument-rated pilot as for a non-instrument-rated pilot. And when I read about that, I said, that is remarkable. But unintended flight into instrument conditions is a very bad thing. And again, I don't know how much mid-air collisions might be new to space. I guess some of them could be. If you don't know which way is up and which way you're flying or moving, and certainly then you lose uh, situational awareness and may not be aware of traffic, especially could contribute to that. Low altitude operations, certainly spatial disorientation contributes to those. And then there's some others on this top 10 list. But my point is there are at least six of these top 10 that I believe are largely affected in a major way by spatial disorientation. So, what I think back on my, my training, private commercial instrument, CFI, I cannot recall, perhaps once, in 40 years of flying multiple flight instruction to me by others, that anyone demonstrated spatial disorientation. And what we need to do is we need to teach our learners, you know, I won't say anything negative about the FAA. However, I don't understand why we're not still students. I have been a student for 64 years. And it's hard to think of myself now as a learner. Teach the learners to understand the susceptibility of the human system to spatial disorientation. That's important. Demonstrate the judgments of aircraft attitude based on this seat of the pants bodily sensations are very often false. Help decrease the occurrence and degree of disorientation through this better understanding of aircraft motion, head movements, and disorientation. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then help instill greater confidence in flying, relying on the flight instruments. And I would say that that's certainly true for our DFR pilots that need at least a basic understanding of the value and the use, the utility of the instruments, but also to remind the IFR pilot that if you're in a condition where you cannot see where you're going, the instruments are very helpful. 
So if you look in um, chapter 17 of the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, very nice description of all of what I'm talking about, including those diagrams of the same circle and so forth. But there's also a description of these six maneuvers that we should do in airplanes um, to demonstrate to our learners um, these false sensations, these uh, precursors to full spatial disorientation. And the, the model here is that when your semicircular canal, the one that's being most affected by whatever you're doing, um, bank, climb, descent, when that semicircular canal is being affected, that's one thing, but if you then move your head or change your body position and put another semicircular canal into that plane that's being accelerated, that's when we get confused. So head movements doing, during um, maneuvers will contribute to this. And when there's two things being affected, climbing while accelerating, accelerating alone can cause something called the somatographic illusion where you have this feeling that you're pitching up as you're accelerating. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but it can be a little disorienting. Um, but if you add to a motion in one plane something else, so accelerating straight and level is one thing, now accelerate and climb. Now you're affecting probably two of the semicircular canals, and that can lead to this confusion and the disorientation. So, that's something you can do with your learners. And you can do this either under a hood or just tell them to close their eyes. Climbing while turning, definitely two semicircular canals affected. Diving while turning, um, just tilting. Or ask, in, in a climb or a turn, ask the learner to pick something up off the floor. And in some people, you gotta be careful about this because in some people, that can cause vertigo. That can be very, very disorienting. But that's something that our learners should know that when they're flying by themselves, they're doing that solo across country and they drop the iPad or they drop the Apple Pencil and they reach down and come back up, the world may all of a sudden be topsy turvy. So changes in head orientation or body position can really cause a problem. So tilting, reversal of motion, in other words, you're accelerating and then you stop. And you now know why. It's because when you stop, the end of life doesn't stop. It's still flying around in there for at least a few seconds. That can be disordered. And then diving or rolling beyond the vertical plane. Um, any of it. Now, um, fortunately, when I did my spin training for my CFI, I didn't get sick, disoriented, or throw up on the instructor. Um, but um, I'm not sure that I would do well, given my teacup experience at Disneyland, whether I'd do well with aerobatics. I, and I'm challenged, I think I'm going to do some aerobatic training to see what would happen um, in terms of the sensory injury. Now, what about, so you've done all that. You've got your instrument student, your primary student, and you showed, you demonstrated those things um, in the airplane. What about the things you could do in the airplane, or you could do in the simulator, that may not be so safe to do in the airplane? Well, you can, for any learner, the um, continued flight into IMC and Marshall VFR weather is a great, we, in central Pennsylvania, we have hills that rise to 2,500, 3,000 feet AGL, and most of our airports are down three, 400 feet. So we've got elevations that are a good 2,000, 2,500 feet above ground level. And we have a number of airports in central Pennsylvania that are, are close by. One of the things we do in the simulator is we'll put pilots in there and we'll take off and it'll be beautiful VMC. And then we'll change it to marginal vehicle. 
We say, okay, now you're headed west. Find the Mifflin County Airport in Marginal Green Farm. Well, that's interesting to see what happens. Um, for the non-instrument rated pilot, they're very soon you know, doing all kinds of gyrations. For the instrument rated pilot, there's two groups of people. There's the group that say, no, I'm not gonna do this. I'm, I'm going back to where we just left. Or there's the group that says, oh, you know, there's some scud running here. But that's an interesting uh, opportunity to show them the dangers of the scud running, scud running and rising terrain that you wouldn't want to do in the airplane, but you can do it in the simulator. You can show the icy effects um, with decreased airspeed, um, increased weight, engine failure. Last month at our monthly pilot meeting, we said, well, let's have a little little go around here. We all, there's about 14, 15 people come to our monthly meeting. So let, let's go and sit and we'll talk about engine failures on take. And we're not going to tell you when those are going to happen. So we gave each person about three or four attempts. And you know, sometimes we'd wait until they were 1,000 feet AGL. They would say, well, I think I can make the turn back. Then, you know, second or third time, we'd pull the throttle at rotation, or pull the throttle at 300 feet AGL. You just can't do that in an airplane safely, but you can do it in the simulator, and you'll get some very interesting responses from the learners. Um, going missed in IMC, our Nathan Gore chairman, who's sitting here, Carrie Couch. She's, and this, I experienced this once, um, going missed into solid IMC in that acceleration and climb. So now you're doing two things that are moving that way. You're accelerating and you're climbing. That can be disoriented. I remember very early in my instrument career, taking off from my home airport in Pittsburgh, and in the initial rotation and climb, I got very, very disoriented. Fortunately, folks on the instruments said, I just can't pay any attention to that feeling that I'm turning, rolling, diving, um, and it went away in a few seconds. But going missed an IMC, when you're going into um, instrument conditions where you're both accelerating and climbing, that can be disorienting, and that's something you can demonstrate in the, in the uh, sim. A vacuum fit um, and loss of the DG, this, and again, you know, we can cover up instruments in the airplane. I know we can do that. But in a full motion simulator like our F1X, it's very interesting when you do instrument failures. And, and you know in the, in the sim, you can program those to occur at various times during the flight. Um, so, you know, when, you, when you're just putting the, the post-it notes or the brown, you know, brain covers on the instruments, that's one thing. But when you schedule these in the sim and they can happen at any time, it's a totally different experience. I was wondering because I've had three vacuum pump failures, yeah. and only one in IMC, so I'm wondering how many other people have had vacuum pump failures. Vacuum pump failures? See, it happens. It happens. It happens. And I think one thing that's really important, I, I scheduled the vacuum pump for myself in the sim last six pack, and I knew it was happening, and I still found myself almost in the probably 60 degree thing. I forgot I already failed it on myself. I've never done that before. I don't want to hear that That tells you everything. Yeah, do it to yourself. Mm -hmm. Still, yeah. It's very disoriented. Very. Um, cross control. <laughs> I, had a, I had a commercial student. I said, okay, now we, we, we got we to maybe ask to show a, a so called accelerated saw. Look, it's only 20 to 30 degrees of bank, and we're just going to go. I said, I can't do that. But yes, you can. Um, but do that on the base of the final turn in an airplane, and you're going to kill yourself. Do it in the simulator, and the learner says, oh, oh. So you can do that in the sim, because that's certainly a place where that happens. And night flying and all kinds of loot, that's the other thing we did in the sim. We, when we were doing those uh, engine failures last month, you know, we were doing it daytime, and we were doing it in in the DMC weather. And then one of the guys who flies an Aerostar, I put him in there and turned off all the lights. So, and now it's dark. Well, 
that engine failure in the dark is a very different experience than the engine failure when it's daylight. Um, and again, you just can't do that safely in the airplane, but you can certainly do it in the city. Um, the, the Redbirds allow haze, thunderstorm, snow, and all kinds of things. And again, you wouldn't necessarily want to fly in an airplane, but what about that student, that porter, who's out there and he's coming back to his home airport at the end of his long cross country, and he's doing it in February in Pennsylvania, and now all of a sudden there's a snow shower. Um, these are the kinds of things you can show. And, you know, again, getting back to my teacup story, the, the Redbird is a mar the FMX is a marvelous instrument. And one day I said to myself, I was in there by myself early last year when we first got this in, and I said, let's, let's turn on the moderate turbulence. I lasted about 10 minutes before I got nauseous. Uh, 10 minutes. Uh, so you can show that uh, in full motion. Uh, and again, you can demonstrate that in, in the plane, but it's much safer to do it in the center. So this, as most of you know, is the, is the view on the VMC day um, at the front of the, uh, the FMX. Um, and the other thing, you know, I mentioned the vacuum pump failure, but this is a list of the things that you can fail in the sim um, that some of this you can replicate to a, a degree in the airplane, but some of it would be would be hard to, to replicate. Um, I don't know how you would replicate an alternator failure. I've had two of those in my Cirrus with two alternators. Um, you know, and things like flat malfunctions, um, GPS failures. Again, you can turn it off, but what about um, setting it up so it fails at random times? Um, Hemostatic blockage, um, difficult to demonstrate in the airplane. Compass malfunctions, um, all those things that you can demonstrate. And I would submit that any of these losses, if the pilot becomes overly focused on the loss, could lead to spatial disorientation. So these are things that you can demonstrate and show um, and see whether in the sim it does precipitate spatial disorientation, and then you can address that uh, to the learner. Um, and my feeling about this is these are potential emergencies, although we've heard a lot about it. You know, in, in medicine, I was telling, telling Karen um, that in, in medicine, we have rules like if you arrive at a cardiac arrest, patients has no pulse and nothing. The first thing you do is take your own pulse. Slow down. Because if you don't slow down, you're going to, that first thing you do, you the second thing. And what we need to do, I believe, in order to reduce the incidence of these several spatial disorientation kinds of accidents, is practice to proficiency these emergency scenarios and the procedures to deal with them in the airplane. Unusual attitude recoveries. Do these in the simulator rat before you do them in the airplane. And some of them, as I said, you cannot do them in the airplane. Um, and with repetition, and of course the beauty of the sim is you can do it over and over and over again, and you don't have to take the time to fly back to that point or taxi back to some point. Um, so I, I think these are the things that we should be doing in the sim. Um, and I have a sign in my office that says, and this is from the 16th century, it was a British physician who said prevention is better than cure because it saves the labor of being sick. So prevention is a good thing. Usually the best remedy. And if you can't read this, here's these two pilots and they're flying along and it's I can see. And they see this billy goat up here and they say, what's a mountain goat doing up here in a cloud tank? <laughs> probably the last thing that he said. Um, so without instrument flight training, obviously, it goes without saying the flight should be avoided in reduced visibility or at night or when the horizon is not visible. And again, for our private students, 
it's not something you would necessarily put them in. Oh, yes, we do night landings with them and, and so forth. You know, think about putting them in the simulator and all of a sudden, day becomes night. They're late on that return from their cross country or, you know, um, all of a sudden, the haze is starting or if you fly next to the Susquehanna River, the fog starts to roll in. Um, a pilot can reduce susceptibility obviously through training and situational awareness and learning how to use the instruments. And, you know, I've been impressed occasionally with IPCs for an instrument pilot and we put them under the hood and all of a sudden you get this sensation or this sense that maybe they're not as comfortable and competent with the instruments as they might be. And again, um, and as you well know, in an AATD, um, you can do an entire IPC in the simulator. And you know, with this new Redbird Pro program, I'm going to take that back to my instrument pilots and say, look, this whole thing of doing proficiency um, and, and maintaining and improving proficiency over time with a score and a feedback and quizzes, that's something that we should all ascribe to. And I think the best place to learn all that is in the simulator. And obviously you have to take it to the airport, but it's best to start in the simulator. And then you can review the things that you've learned in the sim and take them um, to the airplane. I, I saw recently some data from Embry-Riddle um, where they actually measured um, the time to passing check rides. Um, and they have published data that says that in simulator train learners, you reduce the time to being qualified and able to pass a check ride, you reduce that time by 20% with the use of the simulator. So that's Henry Riddle data. Um, reliable data was properly done. Um, as I read the, the report, um, they, they, they did it correctly, and I, I believe those data. Um, so how can it, as I mentioned, an AATD, how can it help us to cope with spatial disorientation? Well, first of all, teach learner to trust the fighters. I mean, that's a platitude, but until you put someone in the situation where they are forced to rely on the instruments and they can't peek out under the hood, you know, and sneak a look to this, put them in there where everything goes gray. Um, and then in a motion simulator like the FMX, you can then get them to disregard those. So say, turn on the turbulence, turn on the motion, and then do these things. Provide training before flying in marginal visibility or over open water. You know, the, the John Kennedy tragedy that did not have to happen in a perfectly good airplane in perfectly good BMC conditions over water at night. But that was a spatial disorientation. Promote proficiency. I reference that from again, platitudinous, but true. Demonstrate safety in IMC weather, dust and darkness, and develop that proficiency for both VFR and IFR pilots. Um, and again, the instrument flying is a skill like any other. And the longer you don't lose it, the, the worse you get. You know, we had a, uh, there's a very famous Pennsylvania case um, of, I believe it was an attorney. An attorney bought a used, but in good condition, Bonanza, an A36, and he flew it from our home airport in Sealand Grove, and he headed down into the Carolinas, had a vacuum pump failure, got disoriented. Killed both him and his wife and another family. Um, and he was an instrument rated pilot in a perfectly capable airplane, but he had an instrument failure. And ensure that whatever outside visual reference are used, they're reliable fixed points. You know, we, we didn't talk about it. I don't think you can demonstrate this in a, in a simulator, but you know about the phenomenon of autokinesis. You got one light out there. And your brain needs a reference point. So if you see just one lit object or dimly lit object, and your brain keeps seeing there's only one, it starts to move it. That's autokinesis because your brain wants a second position or point out there to, to put the, the object in, into reference and um, spatial orientation. Um, so those kind of things can happen, but it's, 
it's also very instructive to put people who fly virtually all their flights in daylight, put them in the sim and make it night, and then make it night marginal VFR. See what happens. All right, so that's my wife and me at Craig Airport. It's actually like that in front of our series that we've flown all over the place. Um, or as one of my teachers once said, bombs, blasts, and criticism. <laughs> You're all way too quiet. You, you said something about um, ignoring the feeling and in a few seconds it went away. Yeah. Is that is that a strategy that can be used in many situations? or is In it some situations. I think what happened there was it, it took 10 or 15 seconds, but I think what happened was I was in an accelerated climb and then all of a sudden it was a constant rate climb and the old end of limb stopped moving and then the sensation went away. So is there a way to recognize it coming or do you always have to be vigilant? You, you have to be aware that it could come and when will it come? Changes in motion, acceleration, deceleration, Banking, climbing, diving, and a combination of climbing or diving. Um, so a climbing turn and a descending turn, that one is... Well, that's where you want to be mindful then. Mindful. And again, do not, do not pick up objects off the floor in any situation where you're in accelerated flight, either a climb or descent or a turn. That is a formula for disorientation. And you can do that. You can do that for people, you know, for learners. See if I says, okay, watch this. We're gonna do a little steep descending turn. Oh, could you pick up my pencil? I just dropped it. And they'll come up and the world will be going around. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a good one to show you. Yeah. Can you decide if your students a little bit for that by asking them to change radio frequency or dial something into GPS so that they get in the turn and then they start doing something? Yes. It's very easily for the turn. Yes, that's a good point. Like Distraction, so not doing any full turn. Doing something else over here. And, and again, that's head movement also. Um, and even minor head movements can induce that disorder. Grabbing something in your bag. Yeah, reaching back over your shoulder. Very good. Yes. 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 Yes.
Yeah, it's just a comment. I think when I was uh, an instrument student, I think you wearing the bottles and everything like that. And then first time going in IMC with my instructor there, okay, well, the bottles are off, here we go. And I mean, I just felt so much more comfortable putting the bottles back on. <laughs> <laughs> You know, this kind of whipping by kind of sensation. I'm looking yeah. at the instruments. I'm not looking outside, but my peripheral vision is catching that. And it was it was very uh, challenging for me to overcome. You make a good through. point. I, I did not mention that, but yes, um, perceived visual motion can actually, instead of making it better, make it worse. Um, and it, it's something that's called the stroboscopic effect. And that repeated visual, like flickering lights or things rushing by quickly, can can also by itself be sort of rain or snow. Rain or snow can do that as well. Yes. Yes. Give me my My At the ground school or the, the flight school where I learned to fly in Baltimore at Martin State Airport, um, the uh, the owner was a kind of a character, and he was. He was a flight instructor, but he didn't instruct. He had a number of other folks who instructed. But he said to me one day, he said, uh, have you done any night flying yet? Uh, yeah, I think we, we've done a little bit of that. He says, well, you, you know what you do at, at night. He says, you, you turn on the landing light. I said, well, of course you do. He says, and you know, if you see something you don't like, you turn the landing light. <laughs> <laughs> on Monday, Monday. Monday. Well, thank you. You've been a very good audience. I hope you